Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Parallax Abstraction, and welcome to the first episode of Geek Bravado, or what I'm kind of calling uh, Geek Bravado Video Companion, or something like that, I don't know. So, what is this thing? Well, it's not really a, a vlog like those channel update videos I've done. What this is going to be is a little sort of companion experiment I'm trying out, if you will. If you've watched any of my videos in the past, you've probably seen in the intro and outro the geekbravado.com web address, and that is my blog that I've been maintaining for, God, probably not that far off from two years now, which is kind of crazy. It's just been something I sort of maintain for fun. It doesn't have a lot of traffic or anything like that. But I tend to just post whatever's on my mind there. Often gaming and tech related, not always. But there are often um, opinions that are contrary to a lot of the popular group think at the time, I suppose. And there's a couple of posts that I've wanted to make. And there's often a lot more to say on them. Sort of rambly, long form stuff that doesn't really fit well within the post. My posts tend to be long to begin with, but as anyone who knows me will tell you, I tend to yap a lot. And I figured for the, for these specific posts, which will not be every post, this is not going to be any kind of regular scheduled thing. It'll, I'll do it whenever I kind of feel like it's appropriate. And all these videos are going to be is just sort of me... I guess talking about the subject of the blog post in a more long-form manner, I don't really make notes about my blog posts or anything ahead of time. I kind of write them on the fly. That's part of the challenge of that of that blog. And this is just kind of my, I guess, stream of consciousness, I guess, while I'm thinking while I'm thinking it up. This is actually my third attempt at this, if you can believe it. The last two attempts at this exact video got trashed because the audio was corrupted because my ASIO driver got damaged somehow and was making me sound like a Cylon for most of it, and there was no saving it. So I think I've corrected it. I've tested it a lot. I really hope this works this time, but <laughs> we'll see what happens anyway. So... This one is, this was going to, this was, the last two times this was kind of a long video, and this one's going to be even longer because in the time that has passed since I lost those two recordings, kind of a bunch of crazy shit's happened. So just a couple of hours ago, Microsoft reversed, apparently completely reversed their position on the Xbox One's DRM that was so controversial. So this post, I should backtrack a little bit here. This post is, uh, or this video is going to be a companion to my post uh, about E3. Talking, I always, I'd like to do one of these, just talking about the E3 of the past, what I thought was cool, but also just sort of a general vibe I got about it, because I follow probably way too much coverage of E3, to be honest with you. And i just like to talk about sort of the general opinion of it and where things seem to be going in that. And obviously, a big elephant in the room this year has been DRM and the concept of game ownership. I'm not going to reiterate the arguments from both sides here or what happened. If you're watching this, you are probably into games, so go look at Giant Bomb or Polygon or Gaming News Site X of your choosing. Everybody's talked about this. The issue has been discussed in a very large form. Microsoft announced some draconian DRM policies. Sony said they were not going to do it. Then Sony got a little wishy-washy on it. And then today, Microsoft came out and said, yeah, we listen to you, and we're not doing any of it anymore. That's kind of where things are now. So I'm going to be adding a fair bit specifically on that before I talk about E3. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about that right now. But what I'm going to also do is I'm going to make note of when I'm done this topic and move into E3 as a whole. And you should see an annotation on the screen right about now uh, that's will, that you can click on that will take you to that section. So if you're not interested on either my views on used games or the way in which the used game issue is being blamed for a lot of other industry problems, then click that annotation and that will take you to the point in the video where I, I go past that. But this is an important issue and frankly was one of the prevailing themes of E3 this year whether we like it or not. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. And the reason for that is, well, kind of an interesting thing happened today. Um, 
Cliff Blazinski, who is the – well, he's – a freelancer now, I guess, or kind of a free agent. He doesn't work for Epic Games anymore, but he was the design director there. And he is the mind behind the entire Gears of War series. And he knows what he's doing. He knows a lot about the industry. He's a very good game designer. I own every Gears game with the exception of Judgment, which I probably will own someday. I played them all. I beat them all. I put many hours of multiplayer in with Gamers With Jobs guys. I like them. They're really, really good games. And I have followed Cliff's games all the way back to the epic Mega Games days, i.e. Jazz Jackrabbit, Jill of the Jungle, etc. And I like those too. He made those games when he was a kid, and the dude is damn smart. You know, people can say what they want about the sort of attitude he presents and the public persona he presents. To be honest, I like it. I... I think there's way too much PR spun crap in this industry. I think not enough people speak their mind. And he always generally has. He doesn't always say things people want to hear, but that's okay. And I respect anyone who has the balls to go on the internet and say what they actually think, and he does. That said, I don't always agree with him. And on the subject of used games, that was certainly the case today. Shortly after this announcement from Microsoft came out, he started to say on Twitter that A point of view that he has held um, up until this point, which is that the AAA business model is cannot continue while used games exist. They cannot coexist. They are bad, and they need to be stopped. And when someone asked him, well, what's going to happen now that Microsoft has reversed their policy, he said, expect to see more studios close and more companies focus on PC and mobile games, which to... AAA enthusiasts like myself is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, I have nothing against PC games. I mean, I love my my gaming PC. I don't care for most mobile games. I think most mobile games are exploitive cow clickers, and not everything, not all of them are like that. But that's where that industry is trending, and that's what sells. And I I don't care for that at all. I like big AAA <coughs> high production value experiences. And the fact of the matter is, you can't get that stuff on mobile, and you're not going to anytime soon. I mean. When I read Chris Plant's story on Polygon today talking about how the biggest thing of E3 was the fact that Apple announced controller support for iOS 7, I mean, I just about popped my eyes out of my sockets. I was rolling them so hard. I mean, the fact of the matter is, look at just games that we've gotten this year. Look at Tomb Raider. Look at Bioshock Infinite. Look at The Last of Us. Look at State of Decay. Look at Metro Last Light. You can't get that stuff on a tablet. You're not going to be able to for years and years yet, if ever. Anyone who thinks that an iPad can reproduce what even the experience that even a current gen console can is deluding themselves and has no idea what the realities are of those machines. And that was the thing that he said. And I I wrote back to him expecting no response because Cliff has a lot of followers, many of whom are very, very passionate. But I, you know, I don't like to stop myself from saying what I think to somebody even because of that of that reason. Um, and I wrote back to him and said, or really, I don't remember exactly what I said. I'm not going to go back and look it up. But basically what I s- said was something along the lines of, or perhaps the industry could look inward and realize that their current budgeting and business models are unsustainable. And I said something along the lines of, I'm pretty sure no one was asking for the Assassin's Creed games to be so bloated that they need 1,000-person teams, to which he responded one word, bullshit, which then, because he did that in a retweet reply, proceeded to have his followers chime in with me as well. And you know what? If you're one of Cliff Blazinski's followers and watching this, credit to you guys, about 90 5% of you were actually very polite, and most of you didn't agree with me, but you phrased yourselves in a very intelligent, debateful, if that's a word, way. You weren't Twitter dickheads. A couple of you were, but whatever. And I got to say, I don't agree with him on that. Listen, I don't work in the industry. I'm no industry business guy. I appreciate that. I'm just a guy who has played video games since he was a kid, who spends, who makes video games his primary hobby, who spends probably what some people would consider obscene amount of money on this hobby every year, and who actually 
pays attention to the industry for for interest's sake. You know, like I know how a lot of the publisher's stock is doing. I know who most of the CEOs are. I follow a lot of business related stuff. And I do that because I find that interesting because the I think when you're heavily invested in a hobby of some kind, it's important to know where it comes from and what's going on behind the scenes in the creation and production of the hobby that you like. If I don't think you're, for me, I, I can't see myself being truly passionate about something and not knowing where it comes from. I can't see myself living in a vacuum, buying the games I enjoy playing them and not wanting to know the health of the place that's making them. Because I want to know if those games are going to keep coming and if they're going to evolve and how they're going to change. So that's why I follow the the business side so much. And I, I just don't agree. I, I, I really don't see... I really don't know who was asking for that and why he, he, you know, he makes the argument that you guys are demanding bigger experiences, you're demanding better graphics, you're demanding this, you're demanding that, and that all costs money, and you guys aren't stepping up and buying new, you're buying used, or you're pirating, or you're doing whatever, and for that reason, we can't make any money, so we can't make the games you want. And I'm sorry, that's wrong. Like, how many reviews, like, I, I have bought and beaten every single Assassin's Creed game except for the PSP game, not the Vita game. I bought and finished the Vita game. Not the I didn't get the PSP game and I haven't played any of their bullshit Facebook crap because I'm not on Facebook. I I have bought brand new on launch every single Assassin's Creed game and I've beaten every single one of them other than those ones that I just mentioned. And I liked Assassin's Creed 3 but my god, that game was so full of filler. And reviews said this too, plenty of them said it. The game had one of the worst, longest, most boring opens of any game in recent memory to me. It was full of meaningless side stuff that didn't matter. Like, it, it, it made no difference. None of it was, was important at all. And it, 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 was, it was such a long game, and like, so much of that content didn't need to be there for it to be meaningful. You could have given me a game that had that story and maybe a third of the side stuff, and I would have been extremely happy with it, and I would have been happy to pay $60 for that. But how many hundreds of less developers and millions and millions of dollars would it have taken to make if they had cut back on that filler? And, like, one of the things I love about the Assassin's Creed games is that despite being an annualized franchise, which, by the way, is another problem that that series has, I don't know why games of that scope have to come out every year. And that's actually what a lot of people who responded to myself and Cliff said as well, is they're like, why do we need these every year? The one thing I will give that series over a lot of other titles, like, say, Call of Duty, is that the Assassin's Creed games actually do vary a fair bit every year mechanics change the a lot of the side stuff changes like it is not literally the same game every year the stories are often different the environments are often very different and every year they add they add different mechanics and different ideas they're not all good tower defense from revelations anyone but <clears throat> they try and i really like that but they do too much i really think they do too much and i know it's crazy to say that i'm getting too much for my money but if that's the reason that Ubisoft, despite being one of the most successful publishers in the industry right now, can still barely find a profit? Then, yeah, scale it back. If your game... If the, indus if the industry is making games in a way that is not sustainable, then they need to stop doing that. That's how business works. The one thing that I hate about the, this industry, and it's the same problem that music, movies, and TV has had over the years, is that they put themselves into these problem, into these boxes. Costs keep going up. They keep doing more and more and more things that people don't necessarily ask for or want. But then they complain that they can't make any money, and they blame everybody except themselves. The bugbear used to be piracy. Now it's used games. It was rentals at one point in time. It always, they always move the goalposts and they never look inward. Like, 
I remember a point in this console generation, not even that many years ago, when a game came out, sold a million copies, and was considered a resounding success for that. It was not that long ago. Now we have games coming out, like we have games like Tomb Raider that sold 3.5 million copies in its first month. More than, if I recall correctly, I remember reading a stat somewhere that said Tomb Raider sold more in its first month than the any previous iteration in the series ever sold. And it was considered an abject failure by Square Enix. Like, you are expecting these games to sell more than they are capable of selling. And you're doing it by doing things like bloating the, the, out the Assassin's Creed games, or in the case of Tomb Raider, adding in a multiplayer mode that nobody asked for, and that when I beat the game about a month and a half ago on PC, no one was playing. Like, how many millions of dollars and developers did that cost you? How many millions less would that game have had to sell if you made it a tight focus single player experience? You know, look, example, another example of a recent game that's bucking that trend. Look at Metro Last Light. This is a game that survived THQ's bankruptcy, was picked up by Deep Silver, a tiny publisher out of Austria who I'm actually I actually think is one of the few who maybe has the idea right currently. It was a game that was narrowly single-player focused, doesn't have any multiplayer crap in it, doesn't have a massive open world. It was focused. It was it was aimed at its at at the audience they knew they could sell it to. It was budgeted accordingly, and apparently it's done exceedingly well. Within a couple of weeks, Deep Silver was saying that it is it surpassed expectations, and that game didn't sell five million copies. I I. Well, it made the NPD top 10, the useless NPD top 10, so it's probably moved well over a million copies at this point. But it still didn't... I guarantee you it hasn't done nearly what Tomb Raider did, and Tomb Raider was considered a failure. So that's the core problem right now. Like, I get that Cliff... This is the thing. Like, I don't want to bag on Cliff. I know why he comes from the position that he does. He worked in the industry. He built his success in the industry. The guy is a multimillionaire because of the work he put into AAA games. And he sees the AAA industry flailing and possibly failing. And that hurts him. And I, I, I get it. I don't like it either. Like, AAA games are my favorite kind of thing. And I hate every... I dread every time one of the big publishers puts out an earnings report right now because they're almost always losing money. You know, the quarter that Bioshock Infinite came out and sold really well, Take-Two lost money. You know, EA is barely making any money right now. You know, Ubisoft is doing okay, but look at the bets they're placing in next gen, and we'll get to that later. You know, THQ, which had a lot of very good ideas and good games in the pipe, dead. Now, we can argue why that is too, but the fact of the matter is, games can't get bigger infinitely. Like, you have to hit a wall at some point, and if you're going to get to a point where games cannot, where you cannot reliably sell a product and make more than you spent on it, then you can't spend as much. It doesn't matter the reason. Even if used games are the reason, your games aren't selling as much as you want, and I don't believe it is. But even if that's the case, you can't it it just doesn't work. It doesn't matter what the reason is. If you if you're spending too much to make your games, you need to spend less. And maybe that means the next Assassin's Creed game won't be as big. Maybe that means the graphics can't be as flashy. And maybe gamers will bitch and moan about that, and maybe even some reviewers will bitch and moan about that. But you know what? Them's the breaks. If you can't afford to make the games that people want, then you can't afford to do it. You know, business isn't a charity. If you're in it to make money, then you need to be basing yourselves around making money. The AAA industry can't do that right now. And if you ban used games, I think if anything, their sales are going to go down even more. I certainly don't think they're going to improve. And then what will they blame next? Like, these companies can only afford to lose money for so many years. And if they continue to do that for, for much longer, they're dead. And if they don't change soon, they'll run out of money before they can survive, before they can fix their problems and survive. And I don't think the way it's working right now isn't going to work. And I, and I don't think used games are the problem. 
if you are a business leader and you're running a company, I used look, I used to run a small business that failed. And you know whose fault it was? Mine. Nobody else's. And the simple fact of the matter is it was my business. I was the one making the decisions on how to run it. And if that that a business model worked for you once does not mean it's you're it's you're permitted to use that business model in, indefinitely. It does not mean that you're entitled to do business the same way for all time. You have to change. Everything has to change. And if you're not willing to, then you're going to die. And that's the simple fact of the matter. You know, if if Epic can't afford to make the next Gears game the way they want to make it because it's going to cost more than they can reasonably recoup, then they can't make it the way they want to make it. And for a creative like Cliff, I'm sure that stings an awful lot. And never having made a video game, I can't begin to appreciate that. But that doesn't change reality. And that doesn't make it anybody else's fault but the industry's. If, you're, if you are in an industry that doesn't work anymore, if you're running your business in a way that doesn't work anymore, the last source you need to blame for that, always the last source you need to blame for that is your customers. Your customers are not the cause of your problems. You're the cause of your problems. If your customers are not buying as many of your products, it's because you are not providing them products they want for the price you are offering it at. That can be any number of reasons, but it's your job as a business leader to figure that out. If you can't do that, then you should step aside and make room for someone who can. That's what happened to me. My business failed because I made some dumb decisions. And there was some bad luck involved too, but that's why my business failed. And that's the problem the games industry has right now. The Xbox One, as it was originally envisioned by Microsoft, was a box that was built around the needs of business before consumers. And that's n the opposite of how you need to make it. Sony came out and, you know, when Sony came out and said, we are on the side of consumers, we listen to you and our console supports used games because we believe in our consumers, that was crap. That uh, Sony, Sony's in business to make money and Sony is desperate for money right now. Sony could afford to be arrogant last gen. Doesn't mean they had a right to be, but they could afford to be arrogant last gen, and they were. Microsoft kind of kicked their ass, and Microsoft now has the money to afford to be arrogant, and that's what they're being now. Sony's up against it. Sony is a very unhealthy company. But, but the thing is, when you're unhealthy, you get vicious, and you learn how to push back, and that's what Sony did. Like... That video that Shuei Yoshida and Adam Boys did on how to share used games on PS4, coming from a large company like that, that is ballsy as hell. And they did that because they're up against it, and they need to make a, a they need to make a fighting case for their machine, and that's what they did. Microsoft hung back and tried to implement a policy that was built around the interests of publishers first and the and the interests of companies that are not that are not succeeding and that's not how you do it and I'm glad Microsoft learned I'm much more interested in the Xbox 1 now than I used to be I pre-ordered a PS4 I actually pre-ordered an Xbox One anyway just to secure a place in line. But did, if had they not changed their policies, I would have eventually canceled it. Now I might keep both. We'll see. I don't know if I'll be able to afford to uh, pay for both come November, but we'll we'll see. The only other argument I'd like to address in this is the number of Cliff's followers who who did respond with the argument, which I consider a straw man, which is the argument that, well, 12 million people bought Assassin's Creed 3, so they obviously thought it was really good, and they obviously wanted all that stuff that you call bloat. So what do you say to that? And my response to that is, I just laid into Assassin's Creed 3 because of all the bloat and problems that it had, and I bought it. I pre-ordered it. And the thing that people don't understand is that... It's not a binary decision. Buying something does not mean you wholly endorse every element of it. Not buying, you know, 
it's not your obligation to refuse to buy a product because it does a couple of things you don't like. You don't vote for a political you don't refuse to vote for a political candidate because he do, he does one thing you don't like and 10 things you do. It that's not how it works. The fact that 12 million people bought Assassin's Creed 3 doesn't mean all 12 million of them thought they did everything right with it. I thought that game was bloated. I thought that game had a terrible open. Everyone I know who played it thought the same thing. A lot of reviewers thought the same thing. The game overall was still really good. When you got past that, it was really excellent. And most of that side stuff, I didn't do. I did the ship stuff, which was really excellent. And I did some other stuff, but I didn't do all the collecting stuff. I didn't do all the boring frontier stuff. I didn't do all the challenges. I didn't do the 100% sync on everything. And that's fine. But creating all that stuff is what made that game need a thousand people across something like seven or eight or nine studios to make it. And you have to wonder how many people cared about that stuff. And if they took it out, how many people would miss it? And would that, you know, if they took all that stuff out, would that game maybe have still sold 12 million copies? Say it didn't, and because they took that stuff out, it sold 10 million copies. Well, if the game cost 30 to 50% less to make because they took all that out, that 10 million copies goes a lot further in a profit sense than the 12 million copies they did sell. So there's something to be said for that as well. But I, can, I mean, there is no video game that I like 100%. There's problems with every creative work. That's just the way it is. If I refuse to pay for everything that I had any kind of problem with, I don't think I'd own any games ever. Like, that's a stupid argument. You you don't refuse to buy something because it does one thing you don't like. Like, I like a lot of what Assassin's Creed does. I like the fact that despite being a yearly franchise, they can mix things up. And I, I'm going to buy Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. It looks fantastic, what I've seen of it. That doesn't mean that it's being developed in an economical way. And if they could, you know, if they were able to cut that budget by 30 to 40% and sell the, but by cutting the bloat and still sell the same number of copies, how many other potentially more risky games could Ubisoft now afford to make? You know, Assassin's Creed, when it was originally created, was a risk that turned into a big franchise. So was Call of Duty 4. Every game that is now a massive franchise at one point started out as a risky new idea. And we need more risky new ideas. But the way you do that is by not tying the entire fate of your company to one or two games. And it's the same problem Hollywood has with movie blockbusters right now. And it's the same problem the record industry had with pop music. It's it's the same. I mean, you can you can draw parallels to this every other in every other way, and in every other way they ran into the same problems. And especially in the case of music, it hasn't worked out so well for them. The mainstream, the big music industry, crashed and burned. And that could happen here too. And I don't want it to, because I really really love these big games. Some of what I saw at E3, and again we'll get to that in a minute. Some of what I saw at E3 for these new systems blew my friggin' mind, and I really want to to I really want to play that stuff. But you know, this can only continue for so long, and if this industry can't find a way to make money reliably, we're not going to get this stuff anymore. But fighting your customers and saying you're the problem because you buy games in a way that's the most economical for you is backwards and that's not how that's not how you do it you know I'm very lucky that I come you know I'm in a very good position where I have a lot of disposable income and I can afford to buy most of the games I want and buy them new most people are not in my position and fewer are in Cliff's position I don't drive an Aventador to work every day so I don't know I I really have to dis have to disagree with him on that and yeah, I think what Microsoft did was smart. I think it was the better idea. I think in another generation, or maybe later in this generation, when they're able to phase discs out completely and make everything digital, then we can talk about that. But we're not there yet. 
we're not there yet, and yeah, something has to change. But your customers are not the problem. When you start blaming them, you've already lost. And that's what Microsoft was doing. And I get where Cliff's coming from, but if he doesn't like the way things are going now, I hope he has a better idea because when banning used games doesn't work, what then? Who You know, what's going to happen at that point? Anyway, I'm repeating myself here. So, sorry, I'm just going to mark this down here. So, yeah, that's that point out of the way. So now let's move on to E3 as a whole. Wow, what a week this was. I can't remember the last time I was this excited about an E3 or when, frankly, a lot of people in the press were this excited about uh, about E3, to be honest with you. People went into this... There was a lot of cynicism going into E3 this year, and people came out stoked. You know, I've been listening to podcasts and reading a lot of articles and stuff this week of people who are just just swimming in enthusiasm now. There's still worries. There's still an element of, is this what's going to finally fix everything? I'm not sure it is. But there's a lot of exciting looking games coming out and a lot of people really excited for it and a lot of people really jazzed for new systems. I always thought for the longest time that one of the biggest problems we were having was that this was that this console generation went on way too long and people were just getting bored. And to a certain degree that seems to be the case. Certainly not the only thing that happened. I mean, it's incredible when you think back at it that when the Xbox 360 came out, there was basically no social media. Facebook existed only for university students. There was no such thing as Twitter. Netflix didn't exist. Most of the streaming media we use today didn't exist. And that we're still using the same, you know, smartphones were barely a thing. The only smartphone at the time was Blackberries. There was no iPhone. There was no Android. There was no anything else. Mobile games were a non-issue. They were crappy licensed cash-in junk, which, well, a lot of it still is. But the amount that's changed over this console generation is astonishing. And it's stuff that neither Microsoft or Sony ever saw coming, to be sure. And that's very, very clear that they're trying to figure out a way to adapt to all that. You know, Microsoft has been all about TV, 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 sports, TV, TV, which is someone who cut the cord on cable back in 2009, I could give a shit about. But that's their strategy. Sony's strategy seems to be, hey, we're going to do some of that, but we're also really going to double down on indie games because we see a potentially huge market there. You know, no one indie game may be able to do the money that an Assassin's Creed 3 can do, but a whole lot of indie games can equal a whole lot of money. And Sony, I think, has a much smarter idea of how to approach that than Microsoft does. Microsoft's idea is, hey, we're all about indies. Here's Minecraft, which is a game that's so big it's basically not indie anymore in the artistic sense, whatever the hell you want to call that. And here's another game from Cappy that we're going to show you for five seconds. And that proves we're behind indie games. Yeah? Indies. Yay. Meanwhile, Sony has this ring of indie developers playing their games live on stage on PS4s. And also saying, hey, you got an indie game, want to put it out on PS4? Do it yourself basically for free. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But it's been a it's been a hell of a week, and I'm I'm really excited for 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 what's coming. You know, I'm a big PC gamer. I always am PC first, always have been. But I pre-ordered a PS4. I will get an Xbox One at some point now, and I'm very excited for a lot of what's coming on there. There's a lot of console-only content that interests me greatly, and I'm very interested to see it. It also looks like the 3DS is doing extremely well, and even the Vita might be getting a little bit of life breathed into it, which is a day one Vita owner I'm extremely happy for. And there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff coming. The Wii U's eh, we'll see about that. But so yeah, if you want to know my thoughts on sort of the big three platform holders and what they announced, um, I did three what I called rapid blogging posts. 
uh, during E3, basically, I watched the three big press events, so the Sony and Microsoft press conferences and that Nintendo Direct thing. And what I did was I made rapid notes of each of them in real time. And then what I tried to do is translate that into a into full-on blog posts where I still listed those points out in the noted fashion, but I sort of ordered them by category and tried to go into more detail about them. And I tried to do that the same day. The Nintendo Direct one was very late, unfortunately, because work got crazy. But I tried to do that, and that was a little exercise to see how quickly I could do it while still sounding semi-coherent. Eh. It didn't work out that well, I don't think. Funny enough, those were the three most viewed articles on Geek Bravado ever, which is weird, but uh, people seem to dig it. But I think next year I'm probably going to try to do that in this kind of way, where I do it as more of a video thing than a, than a written thing, because I, I don't think it came across very well. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, of big stuff coming. Um, but the one, the sort of thing I wanted to talk about was not so much that, the, the individual games, you can see what I said in those blog posts, and you can read coverage of a lot of those games. You don't and shouldn't care what I personally think about any one game. You should draw your own conclusions if you're interested in them. But what I wanted to talk about was more of the sort of overarching narrative of E3, and there always is one. And obviously this year it's transition because there's new hardware coming. These are always the most exciting E3s because there's a whole bunch of unknown and there's a whole bunch of new stuff coming that looks a lot better than the stuff that came before, and everyone gets really excited for that, and it's great. You can feel the energy, and I, I love it. I think it's great. But it's a very different tone this time around, and the reason for that is, well, because of the industry's health, which we've I talked about at length in the first half of this video, or first part of this video, and the problem is, is that there has been this narrative going on in the gaming press and by extension the gaming community for a while now. And the narrative is basically that the industry as we know it right now is unsustainable, that it's heading into, if not already in a crash, a la 1983, and that games as we know them cannot continue to, to exist this way. And the more extreme point of view of people who are saying that tablets are ruling the world, tablets are taking it over, the only people making any money are doing so in the tablet space. In five years, all of gaming is going to be played on iPads with controllers, and there will be no more consoles, there will be no more AAA, everything is going to be, everything is going to be done on your tablet. And I talked about this in the first half too, but I read a story from Chris Plant today at Polygon that just made me face palm, which was the story where he's like, the biggest story of E3 was nothing that was at E3, but the fact that Apple announced controller support for iOS 7, which is just utterly stupid. He, he supposed in the article that basically next the next iPad will be as powerful as a current gen console and in, and shortly after they'll be as powerful as next gen consoles which is utterly asinine anyone who follows this stuff in any kind of way knows that tablets aren't even remotely powerful to the co to the price or to the price to the to the power of a current gen console don't point to me with games like Infinity Blade and say that's an example. That's a game with a, that is uber that is an uber narrow corridor that has no freedom of movement and that has brain dead enemies and that is a 15 minute experience that repeats itself in a Skinner box manner. To compare that to anything that you would get on a console is is just ridiculous. Tablets cannot recreate the experiences that consoles or PCs can, and they won't be able to for a very long time, if ever. And the fact is, Apple's Apple announced third-party controller support for iOS 7, which it was a half-baked measure, and it doesn't matter in the end, and I'll tell you why. Because they're requiring that, ev they're making it optional, number one, and they're requiring that every game be designed for touchscreens first. That means it doesn't matter. Simply, simply put, connect and move for Xbox and PlayStation, respectively, sold a ton of units. And nobody's making games for them. You know why? Because it is a fraction as many units as there are consoles in the world. And if you can't guarantee that everybody's going to have one, then you're severely limiting your audience by making games focused around those devices. It's the same... It's the reason why... One of the reasons why Microsoft is putting a Kinect in every Xbox One bundle. 
why you can't buy an Xbox One without a Kinect, because they want everybody to have one. If you have to design your game around a touchscreen first, you're immediately compromising your vision, because touchscreen games and controller-based games are wholly different design philosophies. If you have to... If you have to design it around the touchscreen first, the controller will just be shoehorned in. And because they're supporting third-party controllers as opposed to uh, c including a controller with the iPad, again, it doesn't matter because there's not going to be enough of them out there. And no one's going to spend a lot of money putting a lot of refinement into controller support for a game on iOS when 5% of the user base are going to have controllers and not even the same controller so they can't even standardize around it. Android's had controller support for a long time now and it's gone nowhere and that's exactly why. It's 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 meaningless. It's a different ecosystem. I don't care for mobile gaming. I don't have a pro problem with it existing. But this narrative that everyone is so convinced and unfortunately it's driven by the fact that most of the tech and gaming press is full of Apple fanboys. But the f this narrative driving the f saying that that everything that isn't tablet gaming is is not going to survive is ridiculous. Ta the mobile game landscape is as hit driven, if not more so, as the console space. If the only time the only things you hear about are the big success stories, like the Rovios and at one point the Zingas and you know the Vlambeers with ridiculous fishing and everything else. They are outliers, extreme outliers. If you look at realistic data, the vast majority of mobile software, forget games, mobile software barely makes any money at all. It barely most games games on mobile platforms don't make enough money to sustain one developer doing it part-time. They certainly don't make enough to sustain a team of people doing it full-time. That's not to say that can't change and it very well could one day. But we're not there yet. We're not even close. And to say that they are going to provide comparable experiences to what you get from, from consoles anytime soon is foolhardy. But anyway. the But the problem is that's been feeding this narrative. It has been a narrative in the press of doom and gloom. It has been... To a certain degree, you know, people going, well, there's new consoles coming and all this other stuff, but it's not going to work. The bleeding is just going to continue. This industry is going to crash if it's not crashing already, and this is all this is all going to fail, and it's all over. And the problem is when people talk about stuff in a circle enough, it starts to become fact in their minds, even if it's not fact in reality. The industry is in decline right now, and the funny thing is nobody really, nobody truly knows why. There's a lot of guesses, but there's no real concrete evidence as to what the root cause is. A lot of people say it's because the generation went on too long. I think that's part of it. People continue to forget that the world economy is still in the toilet, and that a lot of people aren't spending as much money right now. It could be that. It could be a lot of other things. But no one really knows why it's in decline. But if you compare this to what happened with the crash in 83, there are almost no parallels. That crash was sudden. It was practically overnight that the industry died. People have been banging on about this since 2010, that this industry is in a crash. Crashes don't happen over three, four years. They happen over months to a year. This is not something that can't be recovered from. There are companies that are still making money. Not very many and not very much. But they're still around. And I think that that's... I, I do think it's possible for this to be fixed. But as I said in the earlier segment, a lot's going to have to change. A lot of the way they think about making these products is going to have to change. And that hasn't, that hasn't... That's not fully happening yet. But this doom and gloom scenario has been perpetuating to the point where everybody's just kind of believing it on spec. And a lot of these guys have kind of written off this segment of gaming entirely without necessarily a really good reason. And I, I got to ask in a situation like that, if like if you're going into E3 to cover E3 thinking that this that, that the segment of games you're there to talk about is already dead, why are you there? Why are you going to E3? Why are you writing about it? And why 
can't, why don't you step aside and let somebody do it who's interested? Because if you've already written the industry off, you're, no, you're supposed to be there representing the, quote, enthusiast press. And if you're going to go in there talking about... If you're going to go in there talking about how, you know, with it predetermined in your mind that everything's done and it's game over, what, perp- what use are you serving anybody? What use are you serving your readers? The people who read gaming websites are people who are excited about big games and want to see big games. They don't want to hear people talk about... There's nothing wrong with talking about the industry's challenges, but drawing conclusions with no real evidence of them other than some anecdotal stuff and the fact that, you know, you get all excited every time Apple does something because it's Apple, that's not a good enough reason. But I found that a lot of that narrative has changed in the week following E3. Uh, you know, you we can argue about used game DRM and everything else, but the fact of the matter is after this show, the console wars are back. Sony didn't sit on their hands this time. Microsoft said what their idea was, and Sony came back and threw a punch right in their face. They just came back and went, yeah, well, we're doing it this way. Fuck you. And, I mean, standing ovations at a press conference, it got a lot of attention, and it got a lot of people really excited. I mean, I was watching the Sony press conference on the TV in the basement, and because my girlfriend was sleeping upstairs and I, I'll admit when Jack Tretton stood up and said PS4 supports used games, I uncontrollably just went, yes! And that's the funny thing. I can't remember the last time I bought a used game. I don't buy used games. You know, I really, in a direct sort of way, have no horse in that fight. But I know lots of people who do and I know that those people if they didn't have the option to play used games, probably wouldn't play games at all. And I know that's not as healthy for the industry as them playing the way they do. And that's kind of the, I advocate for those people, you know, I sympathize with those people. I may not be directly impacted by it, but just because you're not directly impacted on an issue doesn't mean you can't have an opinion on that issue. And yeah, they, they brought the thunder. It was, it was incredible. And people came out buzzing about it and excited about it and exciting about what excited about what was seen. I do still think that this year, um, every every the press always has to have someone to hate. They always have to have someone to beat up on. Last generation it was Sony, and this generation it's very much Nintendo. I mean, Nintendo does have problems of their own right now. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I've had a Wii U since they launched, basically, and. There's not much to play on it right now, but I'm excited about a lot of what I saw coming from them. Some of it is is retreading old ground, but there is some stuff in there. Some of it's new. Fortunately, not all of it was talked about. The Yoshi Yarn game, oh, my girlfriend was so disappointed to hear that they didn't talk about that this year. There's a lot of stuff coming, but the one thing that I thought was really ridiculous was the amount of press people who were saying, wow, is Nintendo a company playing it safe? And they are to a certain degree, you know, there's a new Mario Kart coming, though it does look a lot different than the ones before it. There is, a, you know, an HDified version of a Zelda game coming. There is a new Pikmin coming, though there haven't exactly been a ton of Pikmin in the last while. But when you look at some of the other big press conferences, some of which were showcasing games that had, like, numbers greater than three in their titles... Like, really, you're going to say Nintendo is playing it safe right now? Seriously? Like, that's unbelievable to me. People seem to have this problem with Nintendo where they think that because they tend to make a lot of games that have similar characters, and in some cases similar themes, that all they do is remake the same game over and over and over again, which is just ridiculous. And... Yeah, we got another Mario Kart this year, but it's not just the same game. It's different than the ones that came before it. You know, Mario 3D World. Yeah, it's another 3D perspective Mario game, 
but it's a different game than the one that was on the 3DS. And the thing that I find hilarious is everybody bitched and complained that there were too many of the new Super Mario Brothers games, and I was one of them. I, I think that's done to death. And they said, we want something different. So they did that. They're giving us one of the 3D games, which were exceptional, on the Wii U, and everybody's saying, oh, good, it's just another one of those. And then what half of them said after seeing that is, oh, I wish it could have been a Mario Galaxy game instead. And I'm like, so instead of them doing this same thing again, you would just rather them do this same thing again, but you're accusing them of playing it safe. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, one of the games they have is Bayonetta 2. Yes, it's a sequel, but it's an M-rated game with a hypersexualized character that bombed when it originally came out on the 360 and the PS3. I love Bayonetta, but nobody bought Bayonetta. That game Bayonetta 2 exists because Nintendo was willing to fund it because Sega wasn't. And it's coming out as an exclusive on the Wii U. That's not playing it safe at all. That's ballsy. Like, they're doing a platform exclusive, Nintendo platform exclusive sequel to a mature brawler title that nobody bought the first one of. How is that safe in any way? It, it's, it just isn't. I would also say that Pikmin isn't safe either. Pikmin, Pikmin sold okay, but Pikmin is not a massive franchise for Nintendo. Pikmin is not Mario. It is not Zelda. It's not even Metroid. You know, but they're doing Pikmin 3 because for years people screamed and Nintendo, where's more Pikmin? And now that we've got more Pikmin, they're playing it safe. Like, what the hell is, like, th that's the problem. This is why I say that the gaming press always needs someone to hate. Because when you're, when you're in their crosshairs, you can't win. There's nothing you can do. There's not, as, there's not enough you can capitulate on to please them. And to stop this sort of circle jerk of negative sentiment that they do. That's what was happening with the Doom and Gloom scenario. And I think E3 might have finally broken that, that sentiment's back a little bit. But now it's the same problem with Nintendo. It doesn't matter what Nintendo does. They'll, you know, if they, if they came out and said, here's a whole pile of new IPs. People would go, where's my Mario? Where's my Zelda? You know, why would I buy why would I buy a Wii U that has no third party support if you're not gonna give me the games I love? And but then they give you the games you love and a couple of risky things like Bayonetta 2, and people complain, oh, they're playing it safe, they're just sticking to the old stuff. Why do you want me to buy the same games over and over again? Like, fuck off. Like it's ridiculous. And I don't consider myself a Nintendo fanboy. Like I, you know, I've skipped a lot of Mario Kart games. I don't even like I don't like Zelda that much. It's okay, but I I'm not that big on it. But I bought I the reason I always support Nintendo is because they may, their games are always exceedingly good and they're always exceedingly good quality and I like some of it, but I'm not crazy devoted to any of it. But the thing that I that I also respect them for is the fact that, yeah, they will put out games when they're good and ready. And they had some gigantic Sony-sized balls on them this year because the Wii U is bombing right now. There is no other way to put it. That system, is a, as it is right now, is an epic failure. They could turn that around. They've done it before. But that thing needs games, and it needs games right now. It needed games a month. It needed games months ago. But what Nintendo said in this Nintendo Direct, which is incredibly, you know, one thing I love about that is that that company has some of the humblest management for a large company that I've ever seen. They're one of the most successful companies in history. You know, they're a hundred years old, but they still have people that you know. Their CEO stands in a video and every before every trailer says. Please, I hope you enjoy this. You're not going to see that from Don Matrick or Jack Tretton. And the thing that I love is despite the fact that they're kind of up against the wall with the Wii U, and Nintendo is still a reasonably healthy company, but nonetheless, this system could be selling a lot better right now and their investors are pissed. They have a bunch of games that are coming that they said, we're going to delay them. And they said straight up, because we don't feel they're ready yet. We do not feel they are at the level of quality that we want them to be and that our customers expect. 
and that dis and the, and despite the fact that they have a system that's not selling because of a lack of software, they went, nope, we're going to hold these games until they're damn good and ready. And that's ballsy, and that deserves respect, not scorn. How many times do we and the gaming press bitch about games that come out unfinished? Hello, every Bethesda release. You know, games that aren't finished, or games that have content held back as day one DLC, or to put in season passes, or all this other garbage that we hate. Nintendo doesn't do any of that. They put out games in a good condition, they don't put out games broken, they don't put out games buggy, and they don't put out games stripped of content that they can try to sell us later. That's admirable in this day and age. And from a company that's in poor fiscal health, for whom a lot of those exploitive measures would probably fix everything... I think that's to be respected, and I do respect them for that. I really wish some of the press would. But other than that, there I'm getting running really long here because, as I said, I ramble. Um, there are two other major overarching themes I saw from E3 this year from the the big the big companies, as it were, as a whole. And I don't know how I feel about either of them, though I potentially like more, one more than the other. So I'll talk about the two of them here. The first one is that everything is becoming open world and extremely socially connected in some way. I mean, you can look at games like Watch Dogs, The Division, Assassin's Creed to a point, the new Need for Speed game, uh, The Crew, Drive Club, and there's other ones too. But um, in almost all the presentations for these games, they were all about how they're big, massive worlds that you can go around in, and almost all the trailers ended up at the tail end, you know, zooming out and going, look at all these other people, oh my god, the whole universe is in your game with you! And they're talking about things like, you know, how in Watch Dogs you can have other players hack your game, and you can do all, all this other meta-social stuff. And don't get me wrong, I think it's kind of cool. Now, I, I'm principally a single-player story and mechanics-focused gamer. I don't play a lot of online multiplayer stuff. When I do, it tends to be with friends only, and it's only very specific stuff. But I do really like what they're showing with stuff like Watch Dogs and The Crew and The Division. Man, The Division looks good! Uh, that game looks so cool. About the fact that you can you can play by yourself... But even when you are playing by yourself, other humans in the world can impact your game in some way that enhances it. And I think that's, I think that's very cool. I, I enjoy that a lot. As long as the game can still be played entirely on my own so that if I go back to the game in five years when there's no community for it, that my experience won't be gimped as a result. That's okay. That's cool, and I like the idea. I like being able to to have some sort of meta meta social aspect to it, where I can tie in and have and do stuff with my friends without necessarily all having to be together or all interacting at the same time. I like the fact that I can do some sort of a multiplayer type thing with Watch Dogs without having to back out of my story and go into a multiplayer matchmaking setup. I like that idea. I, and I mean, I love open world games. I think open world games are badass, and I there's a lot of that. But here's the problem. I talked earlier in this video about bloat, and, well, that's what open world often is. These games, I cannot imagine. Like, Ubisoft has, like, five open world games in development right now. I cannot imagine the money they're spending on these games like the bets they must be rolling for these must be so incredible. Like I can, I if one of those games doesn't sell, I could see it completely erasing this. Like if one of those games doesn't sell and all the others sell exceedingly well, I could see that one failure erasing all the other successes. That is a incredibly risky and I would say bad way of doing business. And it's also not suited to every game. Like, I like plenty of linear story-focused games as well. I like games where it's just, you know, like racing games. I like racing games where it's sometimes where it's just you doing track stuff with menus in between. Not, not everything is tied together in a meta way. And I'm a little concerned about that because I, I'm a little concerned that, number one, it's making the games too big and too costly. And number two, that kind of like I said earlier... 
there are not going to be enough gamers out there to keep very large active communities for all of these products. I mean, you can look at most multiplayer games on consoles, and you have your Call of Duty, you have your Battlefield, you have your sports games, and then most other games either have no community at all or a very, very small one. And the majority of the mainstream public can't afford to buy Watch Dogs, Assassin's Creed, The Division, The Crew, Drive Club, Need for Speed, and put a lot of time into all of those to contribute to the communities for them. Which means that, as per usual, a couple of games are going to get all the community and none of the rest. None of, And the others will not get any of the rest of it. Or little bits of it. I... I can't speak English, I'm doing this too long. And that's a concern for me, is that they're they're spending a lot of time, money, and manpower developing these massive open worlds with these big social hooks, and I'm not sure if it's all if there's gonna be a big enough community to sustain all of that. It's a wild experiment. I hope it works, because I think it could be really cool. But <sighs> I think that's a that's a big risk. And and yeah, if I buy the division and not a lot of other people do do I get any of that social element or is it going to work when there isn't a certain number of people contributing to it? I don't know. I have concerns about that. But we'll see how it works out. I do hope they don't try to make every game like this because I don't think every game needs to be that. You know, I talked about Metro Last Light earlier. Metro Last Light is great because it's a story-focused linear game. If you turn Metro Last Light into some big open world with meta social hooks in it, it wouldn't be good anymore. I don't think. And I hope they don't try to base every major new idea they come out with around that, because that's... I don't know if that's going to work. The second thing, which I am much more down on, is... Oh, yes. Parallax is going to talk about mobile stuff in a negative way again. Drink. Um, is this idea of tablet integration into everything. Now, don't get me wrong... The second screen idea, as they call it, could work. It could be interesting, I think, in some ways. But a lot of what they were showing looked gimmicky as hell at the show this year. Like, in, in a gimmicky and a connect move motion controls kind of way. Like, oh look, I'm playing Watch Dogs and this attack chopper is coming after me. But rather than figure out how to deal with it myself like I would in any other game, I'm going to call on my friend who's sitting on a tablet on the bus and is going to tap the screen to crash the chopper for me. Yay? I don't get it. I don't see what the fun is in that. I don't see what the fun is in that for the guy on the tablet. I don't see what the fun is in that for the guy playing Watch Dogs because that's sucking some of the fun and challenge out of your game. And it just looks like a dumb gimmick to say, oh, we ticked the box that said we have tablet integration. What's the, f what's the fun in that? I, I, don't, I don't understand it. And this is, the, this is the overarching thing I've noticed, both with this open world social thing and with the tablet integration, is that this is clearly all designed around, around keeping players engaged long term so that they don't get rid of the games. So that you don't trade them in, you don't give them away, you don't do whatever. That you buy a game and you keep it. Because that's what they want you to do. And I admit, I would rather they do it through things like this than trying to say, oh, I don't know, ban used games. But, at the same time, how many gimmicks do we have to have fail before we realize that just making better core experiences is better than slapping gimmicks onto it? Motion controls didn't work. 3D didn't work. And now it's all about you know, tying stuff to Facebook games and companion apps largely didn't work, at least up to this point. Now they want to make tablet stuff an integral part of the game experience, and I just don't see the fun in that. Like, I'm not going to sit down in front of my TV with a controller in my hands with a tablet balanced on my knee or my phone balanced on my knee so that I can be looking down at some second screen thing. You know what it's it, it's a lot like, or what it reminds me of, is the, the problem that the DS, 3DS, and the Wii U have. You know how the chief complaint everybody has about games on those systems, at least third-party games, is that all you get on the second screen usually is some boring map or inventory screen that you don't really need and that you never look at? That's what this strikes me as. As, look, you've got your tablet on your knee, and that's going to show you the game map that's kind of in the corner or that you can bring up with one button press anyway. 
I don't want that, and that's distracting. I don't want to be looking down at my tablet. I want to be looking at my 60-inch television while I'm playing and immersed in the game I have. I don't want to have this immersion-breaking second thing. And in terms of, like, well, it gives you something to do in your game world when you're at work or on the bus or eating lunch or on the can or whatever. Again, I don't... Like, I'm a hardcore gamer. I play a lot of games. But I don't... Do do we all do we need to be constant? Giant Bomb addressed this on their podcast that I'm still listening to today. Why do we need to be constantly plugged into our games at all time? You know, like apparently the best use of this tablet integration in more than a gimmicky way was in the division. I never saw this, but they were talking about on Gi- the Giant Bombcast how uh, the division, I guess, makes really really slick use of this, and you can do a lot with it. But everybody was also kind of like, why do I have to be playing The Division on the bus and at work and everything else? Why can't I just sit down at home when I want to play The Division and get my very nice, tight, focused experience and enjoy that? Why do I have to be always plugged into it when I'm not around? Why do I have to be plugged into The Division 24-7, 365, no matter what? And that's a good question. I don't know why either. You know, if I'm if I'm commuting home, I'm not going to be wanting to sit with a tablet crashing helicopters in somebody's game of Watch Dogs. I would rather be playing a game, if I'm going to be playing something on a mobile device, I'd rather play a game that's tailor-made for that platform and that's interesting to me. And it will probably be a game that has nothing to do with Watch Dogs or whatever AAA core gaming experience I have going on at home. They're different markets. You don't need to blend them. They're different kinds of games. You don't need to blend them. And I don't know. We'll again, we'll see how this works out. But motion controls in 3D didn't work. This strikes me as another thing where a bunch of guys in suits were saying, "Oh, uh tablets are popular with the kids right now. Let's plug tablet make make sure we plug tablets into everything. That's our new checkbox." And I I don't think I think it's going to be the kind of thing when Watch Dogs comes out, people are going to download apps to their tablets. They're going to crash a few choppers and be like, "Huh, oh, that's kind of cool." Anyway, and then they're not going to care anymore. Maybe whatever the division has planned is more substantive and will be more interesting, but I I don't know. I I think if Ubisoft, EA, AL want to succeed in both the console and mobile spaces, make good console games and make different good mobile games. Sell two different products to two different people or in some cases the same person. I don't know why you need to sell one product and have it work for you in both places. I don't see the point. Um, but that seems to be a that seems to be a big thing as well. Those were the two big things, other than the new console announcements and everything that comes with that. I mean, it remains to be seen what happens from a capability point of view. The Xbox One and PlayStation Four look fairly similar. I guess the PS Four is a little more powerful. People seem to love both of the controllers, which is great. I don't didn't have many problems with the DualShock Three, but a lot of people did. And a lot of the people who did are saying that the the new one is much better, which is very cool. Uh, I'm very interested to see what happens with both of those those systems. And I do hope I get a lot more games from my Wii U this year. A local Canadian online retailer called Future Shop has a sale every year. We're right around E3. You can pre-order. They list all the games that are being announced at E3 that are yet to come out. And if you pre-order three or more of them, you get $20 off each one. And what I do is I pre-order every year so that I can save some money in the long run. I pre-order every single game I think I could possibly be interested in. And then as those games get closer to release, I cancel the ones that I end up losing interest in. And I keep the ones that I do and I pay less for them. The amount of stuff that I pre-ordered this year was stunning and kind of terrifying. If I actually keep everything that I pre-ordered, I think I'll be paying after taxes well over a thousand dollars worth of games. And these are games that are like a third off. Like that's at that price. And to me, all these people going doom and gloom about AAA games, what this says to me is that there's a lot of stuff coming that I want to play. And there's no shortage of stuff that I want to play, which is still fantastic. And what that says to me is that while the press is sitting around being all doom and gloom saying AAA is dead, the people making these games clearly disagree. You know, Ubisoft in particular, they are spending a ton of money and a lot of it is on new IP and it's new IP that's launching in a massive bombastic way. 
So the industry seems to think there's still a future for this. And yeah, there's a lot of arguments to be made, especially when it came to this, for example, used game thing that I talked about earlier on. There is a lot of arguments to be made that this industry in many ways doesn't know what it's doing. But I think it does in some ways. This is an industry that's still profitable in segments, and you don't get that way by not having at least some idea what you're doing. And they believe this stu there's still a market for this stuff, and I believe there is too. And I hope that the consoles sell well enough and that these games sell well enough that we can finally snap the back of this doom and gloom and tell people, hey, yeah, people do care about more than crappy mobile games. We like big stuff. We want big stuff. And uh, I really hope that's true. But yeah, that's kind of what I took from E3 this year. I saw a lot that I really want to play. I saw some of the press's ideas getting not contradicted outright, but called into question, let's say. And I think that's a good thing. I think gamers need to know that maybe things are not quite as dire as some would like you to believe. And I do see an industry that is still trying to rely on gimmicks to sell new stuff, which is probably not the best way to go about it. But they're gimmicks that seem like they have maybe a bigger chance of succeeding than any of the gimmicks that came before. I hope so. I mean, I don't care about all that tablet crap. But if it, I hope it works in the sense that I hope it does keep people, I hope it does make more people interested in buying big games, and I hope it does keep people engaged longer so that they do keep the games longer, so that they do sell better, so that we can get more of them. That's really what I want. I don't care if the CEO of Ubisoft gets to take home a multi-million dollar bonus this year. I do care that their company continues to turn a profit so that they can continue to make the kinds of games I want. And... They need to find ways to keep people paying in order to make that that happen. And uh, there may be a chance of that. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, so that's kind of what I took from E3 this year. Um, like I said, I'm not commenting on a lot of individual games because everyone else has done that in other in other places. You can get very quick impressions of most of what was announced on those rapid blog posts that I did to see what I'm interested in. But uh, I'd like to hear what you're interested in as well. So if you're watching this and you've actually managed to get it through to the end, I mean, feel free to leave a comment either on YouTube or on the blog itself. I actually prefer YouTube because I'm trying to build more of an audience there right now. But I'd like to hear what excited you, what disappointed you, what did you think was a gimmick? Do you agree with the press's narrative that the industry is, is in an insustainable... An, an, in an unsustainable place and is not uh, destined to do very well? Or do you think they overreacted and do you think they can find a way to bounce back from from this? Do you care if they do or not? Uh, I'm interested in any intelligent commentary or, or debate. Um, you know, unlike a lot of analysts, I don't claim, you know, my... I say that my guesses are guesses and I fully am prepared to be wrong. Uh, so we'll, uh, we will see what happens, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, to this November. Hopefully you guys saw a lot to look forward to as well. And, uh, I'm looking forward to getting a lot of gaming done this year. Maybe not the cost associated with it, but, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. But yeah, this was, uh, this was a long first video. Most of them will probably not be this long, but I wanted to address uh, the little, the little uh, thing that happened with, with Cliff Blazinski today, and I wanted to sort of address him and what some of his people, his people, <laughs> his followers, um, said, because I, I do understand where Cliff's coming from, and I do sympathize with his position to a certain point, but I, th I still think that like a lot of the industry and like Microsoft, he was looking at things the wrong way, and he was placing the blame for the problems in the wrong place and that needed to be addressed so that people could uh, could think about it I guess so this is going to go up with the blog post it might be a couple of days before that goes up so who knows what will happen between now and then I do have to write the post uh, I'm not going to do that tonight don't have time uh, maybe tomorrow but I do want to put this up with it so uh, we'll see what happens with that anyway 
But yeah, thank you guys all very much for watching. Please feel free to uh, leave any comments or feedback you have. Not sure when I'll do the next one of these, but uh, but we'll see, and it will very likely not be not be so long. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.